<laughs> Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. And this is what they said. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the Lord, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that you take up, that you take that He take away the serpents from yeah. us. And Moses prayed for the people. Right. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass. He lived. Thank God. And turn with me to John chapter 4, mm -hmm. verse 14. John chapter 4. I'm sorry, John chapter 3, verse 14. And Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, right. even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Mm. Amen. For a couple moments, I want to preach to you guys this morning on the subject, the lifted up Savior. There you go. The lifted right. up Savior. Lord Jesus, Hallelujah. we worship you and we praise you this morning. Thank you for what you've done in our midst. God, and we turn over the rest of this service to you right now. I pray that you remove every stumbling block, every rock of offense, everything that is hindering us from hearing your word and receiving your word. I pray, God, that the power of the Holy Ghost would fall right now. I pray that you would open every mind to hear and to understand and to receive what you would have. And I come against any spirit that would bind us this morning. I pray, God, that you would release your anointing, release your favor, release your power in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said amen. amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Israel had a problem. They had an extremely bad habit. They complained about everything. Just about every time they stopped in the wilderness, they complained. They complained because they didn't have food, but then when God gave them food, they complained that they didn't like that kind of food. They complained that they didn't have water. And then when God gave them water, they complained that it was too bitter. Right. They complained because they wanted God to speak to them instead of Moses. And so when God came down in a thick cloud and spoke through thunder and lightning, they complained. And they were too frightened. And so they said, no, thank you. I don't want God to speak to us anymore. Go ahead and speak to Moses. Right. Yep. Everywhere they went, they had some sort of issue. And if you take every Come every moment of complaint or murmur that the children of Israel did, and you pull out their reasoning, you pull out their, their the number one argument that they would lay out on the table, Come on now. you would find that they would always say something along the lines of, we had it better in Egypt. There you go. Come on. We ate better in Egypt, we slept better in Egypt, we lived in houses in Egypt. Their problem was, they were just a little bit spoiled. Uh -oh. They ate good food. They had plenty of water, and it would seem, as I read the scriptures, that some of them had become content to live in Egypt, even though they were slaves. Mm -hmm. Even though every single day they worked from sun up to sundown, and they, they built all these buildings, they made bricks out of wheat, they, they slaved, they worked their backs and, until they were sore, but yet right. some of them were had gotten content. Right. Because they ate good and they slept good and they had houses to live in and not just tents. Why but then if you look at Moses, Moses was a man who had a relationship with God that rivaled every single person that came before him. Numbers chapter 12 verse 3 says that Moses was a meek man. Right. And not only was he meek, but he was more meek than any other person in the world. Mm -hmm. He was loved by God. He walked with God. He talked with God face to face. He had a relationship with God that no other man in the world had. Right. 
And he was on par with the likes of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He had a very personal, very close relationship with God. Yes, he did. If you read how God revealed to him the tabernacle plan, you will find that Moses is the only person in the history of Israel that had complete freedom to go before the Ark of the Covenant any time he wanted. Even David, a man after God's own heart, even uh, he wasn't even allowed to go in, be right. in before the, the mercy seat, the ark, the, uh, the high priest of Israel. He was only allowed to go be before the Ark of the Covenant one time a year. But Moses, he could go before the Ark at any point mm. that he wanted because he walked that closely right. with God. God even told Aaron and Miriam, he said, I speak to some people in dreams and I speak to some people in visions. But with Moses, I speak face to face. Yeah. Moses walked so closely with God that God began to reveal himself to Moses a little bit at a time. Specifically, God revealed to him types and shadows of Jesus Christ. Moses did not necessarily understand what was going on, but God was showing him Jesus through different occurrences and different events throughout his life. The whole situation of Israel in bondage was a type and a shadow of the future of Jesus and of Israel. Egypt for 400 years. They, uh, they were slaves in Egypt. They were bound in Egypt for 400 years. They had no deliverer. They had no true spiritual connection. They had no true spiritual leadership. They lived under the authority of another nation in Egypt. And for 400 years, they waited for their deliverer. Right. And finally, Moses is born among them. Then he leaves in fear of a wicked ruler named Pharaoh and goes into a foreign land for a time, then returns as one to lead Israel or to lead the Hebrews out of bondage. Does that sound familiar to anybody? You will find that Israel as a nation went 400 years with no prophet, no word from God, no deliverer, no true spiritual leadership, no true spiritual connection from or with God. For 400 years, they were made subject to foreign powers in the likes of Greece and Rome. For 400 years, they lived under the authority of these nations, waiting for their deliverer. And then Jesus was born on a scene. And he lived for just a little while, and then he left for fear of a, of a wicked ruler named Herod. Right. And he goes into a foreign land, Egypt. Right. And he lives there for a while, and then finally he comes back. And he reveals himself as the Savior, the one to lead his people out of bondage. From the moment that Moses arrives on the scene at Egypt with his brother Aaron, God shows him type after type and shadow after shadow of the death and the, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation over and over and over again. God showed Moses Jesus Christ. God told Moses, tell the people, kill a lamb, and then smear the blood of that lamb on the doorpost, and then have all the families get inside their home and stay inside their home and eat that lamb. Right. Because tonight, the angel of death is going to come in, and he's going to look at every single house throughout the land of Egypt, and if he doesn't see the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, he's going to go into that house, and the firstborn of that house is going to die. When God told Moses that, he was showing him a picture of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also a picture of salvation and of the judgment. When he said, slay the lamb, that was a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Lamb of God being slain. Right. And it was a type and shadow of us climbing up onto the cross that we have to bury and letting our own flesh die out in right. true humble, sincere repentance. Right. When God said, put the blood of the on the doorpost, this was a type and a shadow of the burial of Jesus Christ, and it was a type and a shadow of our burial into Christ through water baptism. Right. Water baptism in Jesus' name is how the blood is applied. Yes. When you go down into the water, in Jesus' name, you're getting covered by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. It's smeared all over your life. And when God said, eat the lamb, this was a type and a shadow of us being filled with the Holy Ghost. 
the lamb that was slain, the lamb whose blood was smeared on the, on the doorpost, the lamb whose blood was shed for our salvation and for their salvation is now getting down inside of us. And it brings us life and it brings us liberty and it marks the era of freedom from sin and freedom from the world. When God said when the angel of death comes and he stands before the door of a house, if he doesn't see the blood, he's going to go and the firstborn will die. That was a type and a shadow of the judgment. When we stand before the throne of God, if he does not see the blood of the lamb covering over our lives, if he does not see the blood of that spotless perfect lamb, Jesus Christ, covering our hearts and our minds, then he will have no choice but to cast us into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. That is why we need to have the blood of Jesus all over our lives, covering our minds, covering our hearts. I want to be covered by the blood of Jesus. We are redeemed not by works, not by talent, not by our own intelligence, but we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, somebody. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I wish I had somebody that would preach with me this morning. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood that washes white as snow. Hallelujah. Why don't you clap your hands and thank God for the blood this morning. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus is a no trespassing sign to the devil. Before you're covered by the blood, the devil has complete access to you through your flesh. But after you're covered by the blood, he cannot access you except by permission from God or permission from you. That's why it's a lot easier to give in to temptation before you're saved. That's why it's a lot harder to get delivered from, from addictions before you're saved. But after you've been saved and you have the blood on your life, then you're protected by the blood. And once you keep yourself under the blood through prayer and submission and consecration, every attempt of attack from hell and every temptation has to go through the blood. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And then it says in verse 11, And they overcame him, that him being Satan, that him being temptation, that him being the, the, the accuser of the blood of the brethren, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Wow. Yes, I understand that that verse of Scripture means and applies to other parts of, of our lives, but I do know that it means that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome temptation, we overcome sin, we overcome bondage by the blood of the Lamb. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye can handle. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Yes. I understand scripture is open for interpretation. But I believe that the way of escape that Jesus is talking about here is the blood of the Lamb. Praying till you get completely under the blood. Praying and pleading the blood of God. Pray, praying and pleading the blood of the Lamb over your lives. Going into that place where you know you can get under the blood and you can come back. You can combat that temptation or that, that kind of sin that's trying to creep into your life. The blood is a covering of, of Jesus Christ, which is why we have power to overcome temptation. Man. So God told Moses, have them cover the doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And we know the story. They covered the doorpost. And, and I'm sure the Egyptians were looking at these people like, what in the world are they doing? That is absolutely barbaric. 
Yeah. Is that some sort of religious thing that they're doing, covering their whole doorpost with blood? What in the world? When you're really covered by the blood, you're going to look a little different. All right, right. You're going to sound a little different, and you're going to act a little different. Right. When you're covered by the blood, people are going to look at you a little differently as well. They're going to treat you different. They're going to have a different feeling when they're around you. They may not see with their physical eyes, but their spirit is looking and it sees the blood of the lamb on you. That's what makes us different. Mm. Come on. Amen. So they smeared the blood, ate the lamb, stayed inside, and the death angel came through and killed the firstborn of every house that didn't have the blood. Every family in Egypt that didn't have the blood, even the firstborn of the animals, the Bible says, were killed by the angel of death. Yep. There and just a side note, this may be a little bit dangerous ground, but if you're the head of your house and there is no blood on your doorpost, then every single thing that happens to your house affects your family and it affects your possessions, but if you have the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, then not only you, but also your entire family is protected by that blood. You and me as the head of our house, we are held responsible for what happens to our family. I understand every single person in this, maybe I will go a little bit deeper into this, I'm feeling something. I understand that every single person can decide for themselves whether they live for God or whether they live for the world. But if you are the head of your house, then you need to make sure you have the blood of God all over your lives. Because when the temptation comes to the family, it first has to go through the head. That is why Jesus Christ, as the head of our salvation, had to die for us. Because now the sin and the temptation has to go through that blood. So as the leader and the head of authority in your house, you need to have the blood on your life. Amen. 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 What happens if the blood circulation gets cut off in a part of your body? Just right. say your arm. Yeah. Now the nurses in the room and the doctors, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but my research shows that if the blood is cut off in a certain part of your body for up to four hours, it can cause per about 50% of damage to nerves and to the muscles mm. of that part of your body. And if it's cut off for six hours or more, it can cause 100% destruction to the muscles in that part of the body. And again, if I'm incorrect, the nurses can correct me and I will apologize and I will uh, seek your forgiveness for leading you astray. But if that is the case, having your blood cut off from a part of your body for six hours or more causes 100% destruction to your muscles, what kind of destruction will happen if the blood of Jesus is cut off? If the blood of Jesus is not flowing in our lives, if the blood of Jesus is not flowing in our minds, then something begins to die. It's not necessarily a physical death right away, but it is a spiritual death. If we do not have the blood of the Lamb on ourselves, then we are dying spiritually. I am off my notes. I am trying to move on, but I can't get past this blood. I don't think we understand exactly how much power is in the blood of the Lamb. I don't think we fully understand how important important it is to have the blood on us. If we have the blood on us, then our backslidden family members see that blood and they're drawn to that blood. If we have the blood of Jesus on us, then every co-worker, every person that we come in contact with sees the blood and feels the blood and is attracted to the blood. That's why you can be walking down Walmart and somebody can come up and tell you, you look just a little bit different. They're feeling and seeing the blood of Jesus. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but I believe somebody in here is a little bit outside of the blood. I know I'm, I may be treading some dangerous waters right now, but I feel something in the spirit. There's somebody either watching or in this room that does not have the blood, and you know that you need to have the blood. I'm trying to preach with as much love as I can, but can I tell you, in the Holy Ghost, you need the blood of the Lamb. You need the blood of the Lamb. There is no deliverance without the blood. There is no freedom without the blood. There is no testimony without the blood of Jesus. Right now, if you do not have the blood, then I will tell you, make up your mind, get it down in your spirit, that you are not going to leave. 
building until you are completely submerged in the blood of the Lamb. If you do not have the blood on your mind and on your heart and on your spirit, then I would implore you, get under the blood. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Why don't you lift up your hands for about 30 seconds? Call on the name of a backslidden loved one right now, right now, right now. He also took a reba handaya. Call on the name of your backslidden father or mother. Call on the name of your backslidden child. Plead the blood over them right now. God is moving through the atmosphere. God is sending angels right now. Right now, he's sending angels to your family. He's sending angels to your friends. Time is wrapping up. There's not much more time in this world to make yourself right with God. So plead the blood. Plead the blood. Hallelujah. 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 The blood. We need the blood. We need the blood. Hallelujah. I'm really trying to move on, but I can't. Where are the intercessors right now? Where are the intercessors right now? Let's linger for just a moment. I don't need to read another word in my notes. We need to listen to the word of the Lord. We need to follow after the Spirit. Go on. If you have the Holy Ghost, start praying in the Holy Ghost right now. God is trying to do a work. Yield yourselves to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. 
Hallelujah. 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 Now after the death angel was done, Moses or Pharaoh said, get out. And so he, the Hebrews left. They took the gold and the silver and spoiled the Egyptians and left. And after they had left, God took them a completely different route than anybody else would have taken. If you do your studies, you will find that God did not have to take them through the Red Sea in order to get to the promised land. But God was trying to show them something. God was trying to reveal something to Moses and to the people. So he took them right up to the Red Sea and he stopped them. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 14 and 1 that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh that he would come after them and to try to take them back into captivity. And sure enough, the armies of Egypt came after them and the angel of God was a thick cloud between them in the day and a pillar of fire before them in the night. The people were afraid, they were scared, they were intimidated. If they looked to the left, they saw mountains. If they looked to the right, they saw mountains. If they looked before them, they saw the Red Sea. And if they looked behind them, they saw the Egyptians. Moses said something in response, something very interesting, something very unique. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Yeah. You do your study. The word salvation in the Hebrew is none other than the word Yeshua. Right. Moses said, stand still and see Yeshua. Guess how the name of Jesus is pronounced in Hebrew? Right. Yeshua. In other words, Moses was, sta was saying, stand still and see Jesus. He had no clue that he was prophesying about Jesus, but God knew what, exactly what he was doing. God was giving him a little glimpse of the future. He was showing him Jesus. He was showing Moses, one day there will be a Savior of the world come and die and he will save you the word jesus means uh, jehovah is my salvation jehovah saves god was their salvation just like he's our salvation right. you may feel the pressure of the enemy all around you you may look to the left and see a financial struggle you may look to the right and see a hopeless situation in your family you may look behind you in your past, the sin, the shame, the iniquity is trying to get to you and pull you back into a world of sin. And when you look before you, all you see is just this red sea. You know what that was? That was a type and a shadow of baptism in Jesus' name. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God parts the, word, the Red Sea, and Moses and the Hebrews go down into the Red Sea, and guess who follows them in? Yeah. Egypt. Their past. The things that had them bound went in after them. And when the Hebrews came up out of the Red Sea, the Egyptians, their past, their slavery, their bondage, it was all destroyed, wiped away by the water. This is a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ, of baptism in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not, ha I would not that ye should be ignorant. No. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It was a type of baptism. Right. When you get baptized in Jesus' name, you go down in the water and guess what follows you in to the water? Your past sin, your past shame, your past condemnation, the very things that used to be chains around your, your neck, and chains around your hand, and chains around your feet. It all goes down in the water. Your sin, your addiction, your shame, your bondage, it all goes down in the water. But when you come up out of the water, I feel like preaching right now. When you come up out of the water, guess what stays in the water? Guess what was washed away by the water? Guess what was destroyed by the water? It was your sin. It was your shame. It was your iniquity. It was your transgression. We were all sinners bound to die. But when we went down in the water, we came up clean. We came up a new creature. I'm preaching to somebody. You'll find your deliverance in the name of 
He come on Shaka Mahaya. You made a new creature when you baptized in his name. Amen. So they go on. They go on. There is a situation of the waters of Mara. It's too bitter to drink, so God tells Moses, throw a tree in the water, and when he does, it's made sweet. Now I could stop here and show you how Jesus is a type of how that tree was a type of Jesus. Jesus is called the root of David. He's a tender branch. He is that tree that makes all things sweet. Yeah. But I'm in a hurry, so we'll go on. Then they get hungry, and God sends manna from heaven. I could stop there and talk about how Jesus is the bread of life. Right. Came down from heaven, descended among men, and he is the bread of life. Yeah. But I'm not even halfway through, and I haven't even got to my main point, so I'll keep going. <laughs> then they get to this place called Rephidim. Right. And they thirst again. So God tells Moses to take the elders, go to a place that where you smoke the river, and I will stand before you on a rock called Horeb. Yep. And you will smite that rock, and water will come up out of that rock, and everybody will be able to drink. So Moses went and smote the rock, and water flowed, and the rock literally followed them around in the wilderness. Yeah. That rock was a type of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 10 and 4. Paul says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Read the context of that scripture. He was talking about <clears throat> Moses and the Hebrews in the wilderness. Again, God showed Moses a type of Jesus. Jesus is the rock that the builders rejected. Right. Jesus is the rock on which the church is built. When Jesus told Peter on this, now you are called Simon, or you are called Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, he was not calling Peter the rock. He was calling himself the rock. On this rock, on me, Jesus is the rock Amen. on which the church is built. Jesus is the rock from which the waters of life flow. Remember when Jesus said to the woman at the well, whosoever drinks of this well water, they're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, they will never right. thirst again. Right. Just as the Hebrews drank from the rock that followed them, so we get our spiritual drink from the rock that saved us, which is Jesus. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the two men who built two different houses, one on the sand, the other on the rock. When the storm came and the winds blew, the only house that survived was the house that was built on the rock, which is Jesus. I don't care how appealing the world looks. I don't care how steady and how safe the world looks. If you build your house on the world, then that world, then that house will crumble. It will fall. But if you build your house on on Jesus, the solid rock, it may not always look pretty, it may not always feel pretty, it may not always seem pretty, but if you build your house on that rock, which is Jesus, it, it doesn't ha matter how much it thunders, it, it doesn't matter how much it's light, how much lightning falls, it doesn't matter how much rain falls, it, it doesn't matter how strong the storm is, it, it doesn't even matter how, how long the storm lasts. If your house is built on Jesus, then when everything's said and done and all the sand is washed away, the house that's built on the rock is still going to be standing. The church that's built on the rock is still going to be standing. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against your family if your house is built on Jesus and if your faith is found in Jesus. Amen. Amen. I won't really get into the tabernacle plan because that alone will take hours. But that whole thing is a type of Christ. Right. Right. From the type of material used, the amount of material the color of the cloth, the arrangement of the furniture, the process of the priests, it was all a type of Christ. Right. But now we find ourselves in Numbers chapter 21. Again, we find the Hebrews complaining about something, but this time they're complaining about the way, the journey, the traveling, constantly moving, in the desert heat, packing up their tents, packing up their families. 
getting on their camels or horses or mules, whatever they rode, and traveling. They were complaining because of the way. But not only that, again, you find the same argument, the same complaint. Again, there is no food. There is no water. They said, have you seriously brought us up out of Egypt to let us die? Yeah. Is that really how much you think of us, Moses? And, and then they said something directly against God. He, they said, there's no food and there's no water. Oh, and we loathe this light bread. Do you remember that God sent manna from heaven? That was the light bread that they were talking about. Right. They were tired of the manna. Mm. You do your research and you will find that that word light, you know what that means? Worthless, contemptible, despicable. In other words, they were saying, God, we loathe that despicable, disgusting, gross, contemptible bread that you gave us. Wow. Wow. They, loathe, they literally loathe the blessings of of God. They were tired of the provision and the miraculous works of God. Because of their wickedness and because of their rebellion, because they despised and rejected the blessings of God, the Bible says that God sent fiery serpents among them. And these serpents bit them and many people died, the Bible says. And isn't that just how it is with sin? Isn't that how it is with humanity? Sin was ushered into the world, and every man, every woman, every child, we're all corrupted by the sin, this wickedness, the rebellion, and it's killing us. The Bible says sin brings forth death. That's what the Bible says, and so the Hebrews get viciously attacked by these fiery serpents, and people begin to die. Everywhere they look is another snake. Everywhere they look, there was another dead body, perhaps a friend, perhaps a loved one, perhaps a neighbor. They saw dead bodies all over, they were all around. They couldn't get away from the sin. They couldn't, from the snakes, they couldn't escape them. Their medicine couldn't heal them. They were suffering. They were hurting. They were dying, filled with poison, filled with anguish. So the Bible says they repented and they went to Moses and said, We've all sinned, for we have spoken against God first and against you. So pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents. So Moses prayed, God, have mercy on your people. Forgive their sins, spare their lives, remove the serpents, restore your blessings. So God told Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And anybody who is bitten by a serpent, if they look, if all they have to do is just simply gaze at that serpent that's on a pole and they will live. So yeah. Moses, as quickly as he could, he starts fashioning the serpent. He was in a rush. People were dying. His people, his friends, men and women who God gave him charge over, they were all dying. So he had a hurry. So he makes this fiery serpent. He grabs the blacksmith's hammer and he begins to beat on it. He begins to pound it. He begins to form and fashion it and mold it. And he, he pounds that serpent over and over and over again until it's ready to be lifted up. And when he's finished getting it ready, he fastens it to a pole and he lifts it up for all to see. And, and when those that were bitten by those fiery serpents looked at the one lifted up in the wilderness, they lived. Oh, I can hear Jesus tell Judas, that which you do, do quickly. Jesus was in a hurry. People were dying from sin. People were trapped in rebellion, trapped in darkness. The serpent, Satan, had sank his fangs into the hearts of humanity, so he had to hurry. He had to get to the cross. I can hear Jesus weeping in the garden so hard that his sweat turned into great drops of blood. I can hear Jesus. He is in agony. He is weeping. Not my your will, but not my will, but your will be done. He knew that if he was going to heal humanity that had been infected by this grievous sin, he was going to have to go to the cross. And so the Roman soldiers grab him and take him. They begin to beat him. They begin to mock him. They begin to curse him. They begin to weep him. They whip him. They crush a crown of thorns on his head. They struck him, spat on him. All the while, they didn't know it, but they were forming that serpent. They were doing the exact same thing that Moses was doing in the wilderness. And when he was, they were ready, when they were finished beating him, when they were finished molding him and fashioning him, he was fastened to the cross with nails in his hands and nails in his feet. 
and lift it up for all to see. I can just hear the voice of the Lord say, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I hear the voice of the Lord saying, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Can I preach what God told me to preach to you? The only phrase that he gave me was tell them to lift your eyes to the lifted up Savior. Lift your eyes to the one who bled and died for you if you've got problems that's plaguing your life. Everything that's going on, every trial, every situation, it can all be solved by gazing on the one that was lifted up for me. Every bit of sin that is in your life, that is sending you to hell, can be removed by the one who is lifted up on a tree. I can hear the psalmist singing. I lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I don't know who you think he was talking about, but I think it was a messianic prophecy. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. I believe that he had no idea, but he was singing a prophecy about Jesus being crucified on Golgotha's hill. When I lift up my eyes to the hills, the only hill that I see is Golgotha. The only hill that I see has a red cross on it. That's where my help comes from. That's where my redeemer comes from. That's where my salvation comes from. I wish somebody would get what I'm feeling right now. Listen, I don't know. I know you don't know me very well. I know you don't know my past, but if you knew what God brought me from, if you knew the path that God delivered me from, you would understand why I'm a little passionate right now. You would understand why I'm a little excited right now. I'd be backslidden somewhere in another part of the world, living for myself, living for the world. But God, who is rich in mercy, lift your eyes to the hills from where your help comes from. It comes from the Lord, the one that was crucified, even though he didn't have to be crucified. Listen, he lived the life that we were supposed to live. He lived the perfect, sinless life that we are required to live, but are incapable of living. And so he died. He died. The only way we will ever be able to escape the death brought on by the vicious poisonous bite of the serpent that brought sin into our lives is if we look to the lifted up Savior. He was lifted up for you. He was lifted up for me. He was lifted up for every person in the world. It doesn't matter what sin has been committed. It doesn't matter if you've committed murder. God still died for you. It doesn't matter if you were addicted to drugs and alcohol. God was still crucified for you. It doesn't matter if you were bound by pornography for years. He's the lifted up Savior for you. Oh my God, my God, my God. When he said on that cross, it is finished. Yes, he was writing away the Old Testament because it was fulfilled. Yes, he was bringing on a new era of grace and mercy. But I believe when he said it was finished and the veil rent in half, the blood and the mercy and the grace of God that was trapped on the Ark of the Covenant got through that veil and now goes throughout the world on whosoever will. I believe when Jesus said it is finished, 
He was saying your sin is finished. He was saying your bondage is finished. He was saying the punishment, the crucifixion, the beating and bruising for you was finished so you could have everlasting life. He was lifted up from the earth just like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up. And just like the Hebrews, we got to lift, we got to look up at the lifted up Savior. Yeah. If you've already been to the water, and you've already been filled with the Holy Ghost, and you make a mistake, and you give in to temptation, all you got to do is look to the lifted up Savior. He will forgive, and he will cover. If you're a backslider in the room, or watching online, it's not too late to come back home. It's not too late to give your life back to God. He was crucified for you and he loves you with, even though you left him. Even though you forsook him just like Peter did. He still loved Peter and he still loves you. He went back to Peter and he'll come back for you. He still got his arms open for you so come back to him today. Stand with me all over this place. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now. But I think we all need to get a good look at the cross. Mm. We all need to stop taking the cross for granted. Can I get a little bold? And I don't mean to step outside of my realm of liberty, but we've forsaken the cross for too long. We've taken what Jesus did for me and for you. We've taken that for granted just a little too long. And so now it's time to look back to the lifted up Savior. Come on, man. In this day and age, we've got to cleave to the cross like never before. We got to do everything we can to give our heart back to God. We've got to do everything we can to keep our eyes on the one who died for you and me. If we have our eyes on anything else, when temptation comes, and when the end of time comes and we're questioned and, and we're asked and, and we are, God forbid, we're giving a, given a choice to either reject the word of God or die if we do not have our eyes on the cross if we do not have our eyes on Jesus then I am afraid that we will choose to reject the name of Jesus right. so right now I would like every hand lifted and every eye and every head bowed and every eye closed I know we can't gather to the front but the front isn't the only place where you can have an altar right, call. Right. The front isn't the only place where you can get a hold of God and change your life. Right now, I want every voice lifted. Come on. Get a hold of the cross. Get a new perspective of the cross. Get a new perspective of what he did for you. Get a new perspective of how he died for you. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Come on, somebody get hold of God. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. You'll find he's not too busy. To hear your heart cry. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he didn't even cry. He didn't open up his mouth and speak. But he let all that stuff happen to him when it should have happened to us. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's have a moment of prayer right now. Get a hold of God right now. Get serious about this thing called living for God right now. Get close to the cross. Get close to the cross. If you will draw nigh to Him, He will draw nigh to you. If you go to the cross, He'll pick you up and turn your life around. The cross is the only way to be saved. The cross is the only way to be redeemed. The cross is the only way to be delivered. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Come on. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God's trying to do something right now. Do you need to leave for more than welcome to. But God's trying to do something right now. God's reaching.
preaching for somebody right now. Stay. 